Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Ashu. Before we dive into today's topic, I want to remind you of two things. One, you're listening to this podcast right now, which means you can take one second out of your time and give us a rating in whatever podcast store you are listening in. I would greatly appreciate that. And second, ebmedicine.net, your home for all of the CME that you need for emergency medicine, pediatric emergency medicine, and urgent care medicine. The EKG course, the laceration course, the tips from the Urgent Care Association convention from 2023, the mobile app, the interactive clinical pathways available to you both on the website and on your mobile device. So many resources at your fingertips and ready to use in your practice today. If you're not a subscriber, go check it out. Lots of deals there, especially if you're bundling multiple journals. And now let's dive into our topic for this month. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. It is Sam Ashu and T.R. Eckler. We are back. <laughs> Today, T.R. is very excited once again to be talking about the emergency department management of gastrointestinal foreign body ingestion. This is the May 2023 article in Emergency Medicine Practice. I'm going to be honest with you. I really have to start off with a riddle and a joke because I just have to get it out of the way at first. Let's do it. I love that even this article's authors and the people putting this together couldn't really figure out a good picture for it. So they picked a guy getting an exam of his lymph nodes in his neck. Loved that. <laughs> Felt like it was just really, really that they just realized there was nothing they could do. But here's my riddle for you. Why is it when you've got a rectal foreign body that the patient doesn't really consider it an emergency until the batteries run out? Actually, this is addressed <laughs> in the <laughs> article. <laughs> Of, of the oddest things, there is actually a section in the article where the author says that most people with rectal foreign bodies, for reasons we don't understand, but can probably postulate or things don't like understand. awkwardness and embarrassment, can will wait sometimes days in order to try, presumably to pass it themselves or remove it themselves before they finally come to seek help because, well, we assume because they're worried about embarrassment and ridicule and that kind of thing. But that's actually addressed in the article, which is, yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. We always want people to come and seek care early, but no one wants to be the story that's being told, right? <laughs> I enjoyed that the majority of people, 51%, declined to provide the reason for how they achieved a rectal foreign body. I that's thought right. that was a telling statistic. I will tell you my favorite part of this article was the abbreviation for foreign body ingestion. Which is FBI. FBI. Yeah. No, I, mean, I mean, I felt like I was reading a government document. This is fantastic. I'm talking about GI FBIs, this entire document. 80 to 90% of FBIs will pass spontaneously. <laughs> All right. But seriously, it's a fantastic article. It is authored by Dr. James Crosby, and he did an outstanding job with the article. It is quite mm -hmm. thorough. It covers both adult and pediatric foreign body ingestions. It covers oral and rectal foreign bodies, and it covers esophageal, gastric, small intestine, large intestine, multiple complications. I mean, it is, once again, a complete chapter on foreign body ingestions provided by EB Medicine. So again, if you're listening to this and you don't have a subscription, this is another one of those reasons why you should. We've got the mobile app, which allows you to pull this up on your mobile device right at the bedside walk through that clinical pathway or view the interactive version of the clinical pathway and figure out what you should be doing with the foreign body in the particular age group. In the article, Dr. Crosby does an evaluation of something like 1,000 articles on GI foreign bodies, narrows them down to 345 abstracts and 93 pertinent discussions and goes through all of the randomized control trials and all of the clinical evidence to summarize everything that we have now at our fingertips here in this article. Interestingly, for the GI FBIs, that's gastrointestinal foreign body ingestion cases, obviously they occur in all age groups, but the majority do occur in children, children under six years of age. So if you're listening and you have children in that age group, this is the reason why 
we put locks on cabinets and we hide electrical cords and we put pill bottles up where they can't reach them because this is the age group that's going to find something and stick it in their mouth. It's also the age group where you get those warnings on toys, has small parts, not for children under six years old. So if your child has a toy with button batteries, small plastic parts, toys that they break, those are things you want to take away from them. Over 70% of the calls to American poison control centers for foreign body ingestions are for young children. So again, providing the body of evidence that this is primarily young children. And there is no gender bias between males and females for foreign body ingestions. It's an equal opportunity ingestion under the age of six. They do occur in adolescents and in adults, and they vary in the type and location depending on age. So in adolescents, looking at all of the poison control data and the data from the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, which is nicely summarized in Table 1, you can see that children and adolescents between the age of 6 and 19 tend to ingest things like glow products, desiccants, small toys, still some batteries there, not as many as in the younger children, but definitely there pencils, thermometers, glass objects, crayons, and then adults tend to have primarily batteries, which was interesting, desiccants, glass objects, thermometers, toys, crayons, and then some of the more obscure things like Christmas ornaments and pencils. I was struck by how common desiccants were, and I was like, well, what? What is, what is the desiccant? And then I went and just Google searched through it to try to see, and then I realized all of those little packets of silica gel that come in everything to make sure nothing gets any moisture or liquid on it when it's in transit, all of those that are sitting around that maybe don't get thrown away, that end up in boxes. And then the glow products, I think I can understand the fascination that kids would have with, there's this glowing liquid. What if I put it inside myself? Like, will I glow? Like, glow I, can, bracelets. I can kind of see glow how both of those two things could happen. Absolutely. So, and as people get older, we're talking intentional ingestions, suicide attempts, those kinds of things. So there are all of those varieties of foreign body ingestions in this data set. Interestingly, some of the anatomical considerations, we always talk about whether or not these things are going to spontaneously pass. And 80% of them, according to the data from the article, will pass spontaneously without requiring any kind of intervention from our gastroenterologists or endoscopists. And that's data actually from the 1980s. Some of the more recent data shows that up to 90% of them can actually pass without requiring endoscopic removal. So that's promising and very helpful when you're trying to deal with one of these cases. There was a great discussion about anatomical locations and how they can complicate foreign body ingestions. And there's a great figure, figure two, which shows in the thoracic cavity, the three primary spots where a foreign body is going to get stuck if you swallow it. Those three are the upper esophageal sphincter at the cricopharyngeus muscle, the middle portion of the esophagus near the aortic arch, and the lower esophageal sphincter. So the three most common places you're going to see a foreign body lodged if it's been swallowed. The adults are mostly located in the lower esophagus, near the lower esophageal sphincter, when they ingest foreign bodies. And in children, they tend to become impacted higher up. So that's not really a surprise to us if you've seen pediatric foreign body ingestions. You generally do tend to see them higher up in the esophagus in younger children. In the gastrointestinal tract, you've got larger foreign bodies especially in adolescents and adults that are getting stuck at the pylorus and the ileocecal valve. And interestingly, there is good data that suggests that the ileocecal valve can pass objects up to two and a half centimeters in size, which is fairly large, I think, for something that you've swallowed. Once you start to get larger than that, then you're talking about things that are more liable to cause obstruction. Patients might need closer observation. The convex portion of the duodenum, so where the duodenum makes that turn, what the radiologists call the duodenal sweep, according to the article, that also limits the length of objects that can pass. And in adults, objects that measure more than six centimeters are unlikely to pass and will likely require removal. 
My new greatest fear from this article is that no one has ever in any published reports passed a toothbrush. So now I look at toothbrushes in a whole new light. If I see one of those on an x-ray, now I have a surgical emergency because it's never going to pass. It is interesting, isn't it? Like not a single case report of spontaneously passing a toothbrush. toothbrush. It doesn't mean it hasn't happened. It just means no one's reported it. But it it. does make you wonder then, is it possible? No one's ever gotten a toothbrush. (laughs) It does make you wonder if it's even possible, if it's never been reported. In children, the length limit is not as well studied, not, there isn't as much agreement. Some of the societal guidelines suggest five to six centimeters in children, and then there are expert opinions that suggest it's actually a little lower than that in young children. There is a case series that's cited in the article of 174 pediatric patients, and the average age there was about two and a half to three, and the endoscopic removal was required for anything over three centimeters in length. So if you're dealing with really young children, Three centimeters is probably a good measure if you're dealing with adults. More than six centimeters is likely a good measure for an object that is going to have to be removed because it's not going to get past that duodenal sweep. And that's talking about anatomical obstructions because of size. There are other things that we should consider when we're talking about foreign body impactions or ingestions. One is the food impaction. And uh, we see lots of these, unfortunately, especially as actually patients get older and have bad gastroesophageal reflux disease, get esophageal strictures, Barrett's esophagus, they get scar tissue buildup in the lower esophagus. All of these are going to increase their risk for food impaction. Table two in the article does a great job of summarizing some of the common locations where those food boluses are going to get stuck. And no surprise, it's going to be the lower esophageal sphincter in adults. The most common kind of foreign body ingestion is the food impaction. The incidence cited in the article is 13 episodes per 100,000, which makes it really not a rare occurrence. Interestingly, it occurs twice as often in men as it does in women, with incidence increasing in age and peaking in the seventh decade of life. So in your 70s is when you're most likely to have an esophageal food impaction. And the typical culprits are no surprise are the meats, the poorly chewed meats, so beef, chicken, and pork, with some kind of underlying structural pathology complicating matters. There is a great discussion also of pointed objects. You've seen some of these? I've seen too many of these. (laughs) I I worry. But I I also would say not as many as the other things, because I think inherently people look at something sharp and they aren't actually as, as apt to insert that into their body because they realize this can be a problem pretty quickly. Thank goodness. Unfortunately, there is that patient population which tends to do this to themselves consistently and deliberately. And those are probably the ones who give us the biggest volume of data on sharp foreign body ingestions. With the sharp objects, especially if they're located beyond endoscopic reach, so that's usually beyond the duodenum, then you're stuck doing serial exams and monitoring. Even in those situations, interestingly, there is still a higher likelihood that the object is going to pass, which I think is fascinating. There's still a very good chance it's going to be passed without complication. But certainly these patients are at higher risk for perforation and require serial abdominal exams. They're at higher propensity for small bowel obstructions. There is a case series of 1,265 children in Hong Kong, these are children, who had a reported 41 cases of metallic sharp objects ingested. Ten of them were able to be removed early, and the rest passed without complication, interestingly enough. So there is some literature to say that even if they're sharp, these things will pass on their own. But it does require closer observation, looking for perforation, hemorrhage, and, of course, the worst complication, death. And then there's button batteries. We talk about button batteries all the time in pediatrics because it is one of the most commonly ingested foreign bodies. The poison control centers get 3,000 calls a year or more. So in 2021, they had 3,000 calls. That was uh, about 2% of the foreign body ingestions, actually. So they get a lot of calls for foreign body ingestions. But about 2% were specifically for button batteries. In the 1990s, the manufacturers were required to... I I found this fact fascinating. They basically, in the 90s, you saw the transition from the prior technology of batteries to now like a lithium-ion battery, and the amount of voltage they could get out of a button battery jumped 
dramatically, like almost by 50%. And excellent for if you're making toys and being able to power things. But boy, from the terms of the ability for it to cause erosions and run a current into your esophageal wall or your intestinal wall, what do they say? A sevenfold increase in the number of significant injuries from button batteries. That's a big deal. It is a big deal. It is a big deal. And if you're wondering what we're talking about, the lithium ion batteries obviously hold a charge and you've got a saline type environment with lots of electrolytes lining your mucosal tract and then the soft tissue is touching both ends. And so you just generate a circuit and current starts to flow out of the battery and burn all of the surrounding tissues. And if it's in there long enough, it will necrose the tissues and erode through them. And that's when you're dealing with disastrous complications, the worst of which becomes an esophageal aortic fistula in which a person just bleeds to death. And unfortunately, those cases have terrible mortality associated with them, which makes it very important to identify that someone has ingested one of these early on and remove it so that they're just getting mucosal injuries and not getting full thickness necrosis and then fistula formation. The burns from these button batteries can start as early as 15 minutes after ingestion. And complications are things like ulcerations, which happen in about 22% of cases, perforations, which happen in about 18% of cases, strictures, which happen in about 13% of cases. And there is data that actually says if you develop the devastating complication in aortoesophageal fistula, that more than often results in death. And it occurs 18 days after the button battery removal. So if it's been in there a long time, caused that full tissue necrosis, and the patient has successfully had it removed and seems to be doing well, and then suddenly comes in with upper GI hemorrhage, this is the culprit. And unfortunately, the mortality rate is terrible. Only 18% survived, according to the National Poison Center Registry. That's a dismal statistic. So you're looking at 82% of those cases result in the patient's death, which is why we are just so concerned about getting these things removed. This article was awesome for me for basically reinforcing my sense that if I see a kid and I see an x-ray that looks like a button battery, if they're in my emergency room, I'm getting my ENT there as soon as humanly possible. And I'm really like banging the drum and making everybody feel like this is a, a giant deal. And if this kid is in an outlying area, I want this kid moved to me as soon as possible because I had one where a doctor called me and was like, oh, you know, I think this is a coin. And I said, well, are you sure? And he's like, ah, oh, there might be a little bit of an edge. And he sent me a couple pictures, just texted me a couple pictures, and it looked like a button battery right off. And I said, you need to get this kid moving now. And the kid did great. He came down, ENT met him as he got to the ER. But I, I think this reinforced my sense that these are a serious emergency and every minute that you can get that battery out sooner counts. So in a time where I think a lot of very serious things seem so commonplace to us, this is still something that gets me excited. And I really try to get people moving as soon as they can with this. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. And then depending on your institution, you may need Pete's GI. ENT will typically go after them if they're in the upper airway or the upper third of the esophagus, depending on whatever your local protocol is. And then if it's beyond that, then you're looking for Pete's GI. And if you don't have Pete's GI, you've got to transfer that patient. So Really being hyper aware of what your local capabilities are is very important. There's a great picture, figure five, of what it looks like when you take a button battery and slice open a hot dog, put it inside and just close up the hot dog and wait a few minutes uh, and then wait a few hours and look at the difference as the injury starts to occur and you can see the voltage and the current from the button battery causing a local necrosis in the hot dog and think, wow, that's someone's esophagus, and this happened in a short period of time, think of what it's going to happen as you're waiting for transfer, a flight to go to another hospital, your specialist to come in, the endoscopy team to get ready. It can take a long time, relatively speaking, to finally get that button battery out, which just stresses the importance that you got to jump on these cases early so that your part of it doesn't take as long because you know there's going to be multiple steps in this process. That, that hot dog picture really stuck with me too, because the bigger the size of the battery, the bigger the current they can produce and the bigger the burn and ulcer that they're going to make. And it also made their later follow-up hit home that if you have one of these kids and you're sitting waiting, 
you can give them honey or caraphate and neutralize some of that environment there and lessen the degree of the ulceration. And, and they don't consider that for basically like trying to keep the patient NPO because it can make a significant difference in the amount of ulceration and burning that you get. So that's a new tool that I've got in my back pocket for these. That's a great point. If the patient is over 12 months of age, the National Capital Poison Center recommends up to six doses given every 10 minutes, five to 10 mLs of pure honey or sucralfate to anybody who can tolerate it if they have a foreign body ingestion like a battery within the last 12 hours. And that's because there have been some animal studies that have shown that honey and sucralfate neutralize the elevated tissue pH that results from alkaline batteries and decreases the thickness and size of burns. So even in a patient, as you mentioned, who's NPO and awaiting endoscopy, it's still recommended to give them five to 10 milliliters of pure honey or sucralfate while you're waiting. And if the patient is less than 12 months of age, it's not recommended because of the risk of infant botulism. So instead of giving honey, you might give them a sucralfate solution. Uh, and that's really the only thing they're going to take orally while they're waiting for endoscopy. So yeah, a great point. And lastly, we talk about magnets. So again, when we're dealing with children, but also sometimes in adults, we think about magnet ingestions with the newer, stronger magnets that are available in toys, small little magnets that come in sets of like a thousand pieces. So you can make cool shapes and objects. The propensity to swallow one of these has gone way up. And the concern there is that if you have two or more magnets in the gastrointestinal tract, that they will attract each other and then pinch soft tissue in between, therefore resulting in necrosis and injury and the same fistula formation and all of those difficulties that can occur. And so if you've got more than one magnet ingested, these are cases where emergent endoscopy can be helpful to remove them as soon as possible. If they have passed beyond the duodenum and can't be reached anymore, then they're going to require very close observation. And then lastly, the colorectal foreign bodies. Really, as we mentioned before, there is good data that says that typically the time from insertion to presentation is anywhere from two to seven days and that patients definitely delay their presentation to the emergency department. These come in all varieties for whatever reason and sometimes are associated with symptoms of obstruction like nausea, vomiting, or abdominal pain. Typically, there is a history. The patient's going to tell you that this is going on, but sometimes it's not there, and so we do rely heavily on imaging to try and make this diagnosis. And that's kind of the volume of the foreign bodies that might appear in the gastrointestinal tract. When we talk about treatment and starting with pre-hospital care, really it's just gathering information that seems to be the critical step in bringing this patient to the emergency department. So knowing, did they ingest a battery? Did they ingest a magnet? Is there a sample of whatever it is they ingested there at the scene that you can bring along with you? Because it becomes helpful to us treating the patient in the emergency department to know what kind of battery it was, what the voltage is, what the size is, how many they took, and whether or not there is any other complicating factor. So it's, it's really mostly history. There is, of course, your primary survey, making sure they're hemodynamically stable, making sure that their airway is open. If that patient is not in any kind of acute respiratory distress, you're not doing finger sweeps. The poison control centers are not telling parents to do that either. If the patient is breathing well, talking okay, and not in any kind of severe extremis, that's not something that's performed anymore. I think, I think to your point, this always goes to what I call the, the doctor house investigation. You basically get the patient and you're talking to him, you're talking to EMS, and then it's always, well, is anyone home that can send me a picture of where the little kid was or what the toy was they're playing with or what those glow sticks were or what those desiccant packets were? Because I find that a lot of times if you can get a little more information or a little packaging or labeling, poison control are wizards in terms of coming up with, oh, okay, this is this. It comes from this company. It, it basically contains this. And a lot of times it takes the danger level down because then they know exactly what they're dealing with. And it makes their recommendations even more clear and focused and exact in terms of what the thing you need to worry about is. Yeah. And, and like you said, if there was more than one battery at the scene, because there were four batteries in this toy and they swallowed one, they can bring in one of the others, which has a code on it. And you can share that code 
search it online or even ask the poison control center and they'll tell you the voltage and the current it can generate and how much more lethal this battery is versus any other kind depending on the code that you share. Yeah, I, I found that humbling. I learned so much about button batteries, but the fact that the lithium batteries generate almost twice the voltage of all of the other batteries, it left me humbled in terms of the fact that power change made these so much more dangerous than, than they used to be. It, it made me nostalgic for the 90s. <laughs> when it comes to physical examination, there's no magic there. It primarily depends on where it is and what kind of symptoms it's causing. There are some that are going to be very minimally symptomatic in little kids. If it's lodged in the mid-esophagus and they're tolerating their secretions, they may not look to be in much distress. But if there's concern that they swallowed something, you're going to get some imaging. And you're going to get that kind of mouth to anus imaging in little babies to try and figure out where it might be. In adults who can give you a pretty good history, you may only need the chest x-ray and you be, should be able to pick that up if it's in the esophagus. Obviously, if they have a rectal foreign body, hopefully they're giving you that history and examination there is going to be primarily making sure you can reach the object to try and remove it. Interestingly, you do have to keep in mind that some rectal foreign bodies can be sharp and blind digital rectal examinations can actually cause injury to the examiner in that kind of scenario. So that might be the one time where you obtain imaging first before you go doing a digital rectal examination to try and figure out if you can remove whatever it is, especially if the patient isn't giving you a, a very accurate or forthcoming history. When we're talking about imaging for this, Sam, this is one of the questions I wanted to ask you with your experience, because th there's a discussion th that I think is what we're about to get to, which is that radiographs show us a lot of things, but there's a lot of limits to what you can see on x-ray. And then I find this is one of the hangups that I struggle with in these, which is when to do a CT on a child, especially because I think in adults, I'm a little less worried about their radiation exposure and the adults are going to hold still. But in a young child that's scared and they're not going to do the CT, what do you do for sedation for a kid like this if you think you need to get a really good CT to rule out a foreign body? Yeah, that's a great question. The article does say that even as long ago as 2001, which doesn't really seem all that long ago, there was a published study that stated only 144 of 400 foreign bodies were actually detected on x-ray imaging and that they were later picked up on endoscopy. And that really just drives home the point that you need to know what it is you are suspecting is in the GI tract and what it's potentially made of. If it's metallic, you're going to see that on plain film, certainly on CT. If it's bony, like we're talking a fish bone, that's pretty tiny. It's quite easy to miss those on x-ray. A little better to pick them up on CT, but even then, a radiologist really has to know kind of where you suspect it might be, where the patient's symptoms are, so you can really hone in their eyes on a specific anatomical location. In children, if you're suspecting some kind of foreign body that's non-metallic and you have pretty benign imaging then it's down to that clinical examination. If the patient has a concerning exam, then yeah, by all means, at that point, I'd probably consult the specialist first and say, would you like me to, or can, should I be obtaining a CT to help you? Because this is what the patient's presenting with. They ingested something plastic. We see nothing on the imaging. They're quite symptomatic. I think they're going to need an endoscopy or they're going to need to be monitored here in the hospital because they have significant abdominal pain, but the plain film imaging is benign. Do you want me to get a CT scan? And then just have that discussion when it comes to agents to use for sedation. That's a, a little beyond the scope of this article. Personally, I don't have any reservation in giving a child ketamine anytime for anything. <laughs> uh, you know, they have IV access. You're going to get some CT imaging. You need to sedate them, We're starting them on just a little maintenance fluid making sure they're on the appropriate monitoring equipment. In our emergency department, we are fortunate that the CT scanner is just you know, in the department itself. And so it's not a big deal for me and the respiratory therapist to come and monitor a child in there, just like it would be to do a procedure in the room. If you're working in a hospital where your radiology department is on another floor, another wing of the hospital, that's a whole different scenario. You certainly don't want to be giving a sedative and then just shipping them out of the department. You may have to go with them. And so Hopefully, you've already got some kind of protocol for that. But th those are the kinds of things you need to keep in mind. I would say 
it's 100% driven on whether or not they're symptomatic and what it is you think they've ingested. So there is some complex decision-making going on there, but if they're very symptomatic, even if you don't see it, there is voluminous literature to suggest that we miss a lot of things that are non-metallic and you can't, you just can't rely on that plain film imaging. I, I found that, that CT though being reported between 90 and 100%, I think this backs up your point that if you really think there's something there, the answer is go look with a camera and see what's down there. And it, it, depending on where you think it might be is who you're asking to go look with a camera. But it also supported my sense that if you really think there's something there, regardless of what the x-ray and the CT shows, that it's still a good idea to go look and see if you can find it. Yeah, that sensitivity, that 90 to 100% sensitivity for CT is for small fish bones. And bones are radiolucent, so you're going to see them, which is great. You might see them on plain films. I've missed many of these on plain films where I've looked at the film and gone, I don't see anything. I'm going after it on CT. And then in retrospect, the radiologist will say, oh, yeah, we, we could see it on the x-ray. Now, right here. now that I can see it on the CT, I can show you where it is on the x-ray. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and you don't have to use contrast. These are non-contrast studies. But honestly, people come in with food bolus impactions all the time. And when I'm talking to our GI colleagues, it's always just, are they symptomatic? Can they tolerate their secretions? Are they having any trouble with their airway? And it sounds like we need to scope this person, especially if you say, hey, this is somebody who is 75, has known esophageal strictures, has been dilated about 50,000 times, and it's been about two years since their last dilation, and they were chomping on a piece of steak this evening and felt to get stuck. It's like, okay, this is a no-brainer. It doesn't really matter what the x-ray shows. It's just a matter of how quickly can I get the endoscopy team in there to get it done. So there are going to be those cases where imaging is probably just unnecessary because because they're going to have to go after it regardless. Fully agree. Those are those are easy ones. I like those where I can say, look, the, the pipes don't connect anymore. Someone needs to unclog this pipe. That's right. Rectal foreign bodies. Again, you, you want to get that imaging before you do the rectal exam if there's any concern that there's something sharp there. And then most of that management is just are you going to be able to remove it in the emergency department or are they going to need a surgeon to do it? The complications from those are really going to occur either with insertion or with removal. And they're going to include things like local injury, tears of the mucosal lining, and heaven forbid, some kind of perforation. If they come in with already a tense and rigid abdomen because it's been in there for a week and it's just been worsening, this person is probably already perforated. And so just making sure you involve the specialists, especially your surgical colleagues early in those kinds of cases. Expectant management, again, depending on what it is that they have ingested, the majority of foreign body ingestions are going to be managed in this manner, where you're going to determine are they a low risk, and if they are, then we're just going to monitor and see if they pass it. Again, a low risk object is something that isn't sharp, it's not pointed, it's not bigger than two and a half centimeters, so it can pass through that ileocecal valve. It's not longer than six centimeters, so it can get around that duodenal turn. And eventually it's going to pass. Our, our GI colleagues will give them up to one to two weeks to pass a foreign body as long as the patient isn't symptomatic. So again, the person doesn't have a bowel obstruction. They're not vomiting. They're not having severe pain. They're not really having any symptoms. It's just in there. This causes a lot of anxiety, especially for parents who go, oh my goodness, there's this thing inside them and, and now what are we going to do about it? And honestly, sometimes they just need a little calming down to say, hey, it's going to pass. And when it does, you may not even know it because it's going to be covered in stool. We tell people to monitor their stool and check for output. But honestly, I don't know if you've ever had to sift through the stool for your own child before. I find that to be a task that most parents are not going to do exceptionally well when they're looking for a small magnet. I view this as an opportunity to encourage them to increase the child's fruit and vegetable intake because more fiber will ensure that this passes quick. There you go. <laughs> there you go. And then typically they're following up with their pediatrician as an outpatient and getting some abdominal films to make sure this foreign body that you can see has passed. If it's a foreign body that they can't see, it's made of plastic or something, then again, it's a clinical examination, making sure they're low risk. If you have enough information to say that they're low risk, then it's outpatient follow-up. And again, they'll give you two to three weeks to pass that foreign body with outpatient follow-up. Endoscopy can be performed with a rigid endoscope and a flexible endoscope, and the flexible ones go way farther into some portions of the duodenum. 
and are capable of removing some pretty fantastic things. There's a great picture in figure 10 of an open safety pin being removed by endoscopy where they can grasp it with some snippers and then slide a tube over the safety pin to close it and pull that protruding sharp point away and safely remove it. And so it's pretty cool what they can get out of a human with endoscopy. There is a description of this bougenage technique, which I have personally never seen, but it is something that is technically in our armamentarium. This is an esophageal bougenage procedure where a trained clinician, someone who hopefully has done this before and is not just watching a YouTube video for the first time, takes a esophageal bougie, a Hearst dilator, it's called, with a weighted end and blindly pushes an object that's impacted somewhere in the mid-esophagus down towards the stomach. There is a picture of it in figure 11. It looks like a black-weighted garden hose that you're putting down someone's esophagus and pushing a foreign body down into the stomach. It's helpful if you're far away from help, from an endoscopist, especially in a child who's in distress. And if you have this around and you're trained and comfortable doing it, this is, it's certainly an option. Interestingly, the article goes on to say that the technique requires specific training. And in most studies, it was used only if the foreign body ingestion met three criteria. One, that the child was over the age of one. Two, that there was an obvious coin in the esophagus below the level of the clavicle. So that's usually where your ENT colleagues are going to find their cutoff. And three, the coin was ingested within the previous 24 hours and without any history of recurrent ingestions or esophageal pathology in the past. So even with this described technique, there is some limited data because it's not often performed, especially now where we can typically get patients to endoscopists. But something you should be aware that you can use, and that's called a Hearst dilator. And the technique is called esophageal bougenage, which is like a bougie with an A-G-E at the end. Having, yeah. having been in rural places where you may not be able to get someone to a, a uh, endoscopist in the time you want based on weather or based on the availability of transportation, I would tell you that this is something that intrigued me as a temporizing measure and something that I'd want to have. But it's worth noting that you don't need just the bougie. You also need bite blocks so that basically you can slide the tube freely even if the kid is trying to bite down on it. And it, it would require multiple pieces of special equipment to, to be able to do it appropriate. Yeah, the article actually does go on to describe performing this in a child seated in a parent's arms. And really, I, I personally cannot imagine doing this on an awake patient. But I suppose it is theoretically the equivalent of an orogastric tube. Now, we put in nasogastric tubes in awake patients. Putting in an orogastric tube in an awake patient is usually just going to make them throw up. And having to wrangle a child, especially a young child, with a bite block while you're shoving a garden hose down their esophagus, I certainly would say this child is going to need sedation and you're going to be doing this under sedation and not awake. Um, there is also the Foley catheter technique. And this is really just threading a Foley past the foreign body in the esophagus, blowing up the balloon and pulling it back out through the mouth in an attempt to try and dislodge the foreign body and bring it back up with the one complication you don't want being that it then just falls into their trachea and causes airway obstruction. <laughs> so you do have to be careful about positioning and technique. And this is, in most studies, reported as being performed with fluoroscopy, although it can be done blind. So it's an option. And it's, again, another one of those things that the American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopists recommend against using if at all possible, if you have a trained endoscopist available or within reach. But again, if you're out there in the middle of nowhere and you need something, one more thing to put in your back pocket, a Foley catheter. A couple of specific suggestions. If the foreign body is in the esophagus, you're trying to get it out within two to six hours. Certainly if it's a battery, it's as soon as possible. We talked about honey or sucralfate to neutralize the elevated tissue pH that results from battery ingestions. And again, that's 5 to 10 mLs pure honey or sucralfate every 10 minutes, up to six doses while you're waiting for endoscopy and keeping them otherwise NPO. If they're sharp objects in the gastrointestinal tract, those things need to come out 
you're looking at those same kind of two to six hour window if they're in the esophagus and if they're in the stomach or the duodenum, then, you know, ideally in less than 24 hours. So you don't necessarily have to call the endoscopy team at one o'clock in the morning. It can be done later in the morning if necessary, but that patient's not going to go home. Distal sharp objects can be managed expectantly, and that's in consultation with your surgical colleagues, depending on their abdominal examination. And then the removal of rectal foreign bodies. In the emergency department, if you can reach it and you can get it out, that's great. Sometimes they have smooth or round edges and you're not able to get a grasp of them. I personally have a very low threshold for calling my general surgeon or colorectal surgeon and saying this person needs to go to the OR. There is some description in the article of the lithotomy position, pushing on the upper abdomen, trying to deliver or encourage the object to get lower into the GI tract, especially if it's migrated up into the upper sigmoid or the descending colon. But again, I have a very low threshold for calling general surgery to get these things taken out. I think this is one of those times where Having been in rural places, I've seen a few of these where you can't get them out. The patient's really uncomfortable. And either you, if you have a surgeon, you can take them to the OR and put them in lithotomy and sedate them. But even just if you can put them in lithotomy in the ER and give them some propofol, I find the muscle relaxation is 90% of the battle. And I've seen several of these come out without actually any clinician manipulation, just from proper positioning and sedation. I even know one that, that ejected with force out into the chest of a surgeon who wasn't quite ready for the procedure yet. Wow. So relaxing that anal sphincter, right, which is the only thing holding the foreign body in place at that point, probably spasms and pain. Sedation and position is most of the battle, Sam. Sedation and position. Fantastic. There is also a great explanation in the article about body packing. So body packers are people who are smuggling illicit substances, drugs, in small packages that they've ingested to try and get them across a border. They might be doing it under duress. And these can be filled with things like cocaine or fentanyl or other illicit substances. And sometimes they'll come to your emergency department having ruptured one of these, in which case they're extremely symptomatic. It's not subtle. Sometimes they're arriving admitting that they've ingested them and they just want them out or in the custody of law enforcement who says they're asymptomatic, but they need to come out because we need to recover these packages. And then you're doing things like whole bowel irrigation, which involves sometimes NG tube placement for two liters an hour of polyethylene glycol solution until it's just clear liquid effluent coming out the other end along with all of these packets and typically relying on imaging in that scenario to make sure all the packets are out before you're okay releasing a patient. But this is probably the one scenario where you're not going after these with endoscopy because the small little clippers are going to rupture these packages and you're not going to be giving them any kind of oil-based enema or laxative because that can erode the material that the packages are made of and increase the propensity for rupture. So it's really whole bowel irrigation and making sure all the packets come out. I also felt like this left me with a new tool for my patients that say not, nothing works for their constipation. Now I, I really do have like the nuclear option that I can offer them, which is, I mean, we have whole bowel irrigation if you really think that you need it, sir. I'm just going to tell you now that if I'm covering the observation unit that day and you and call I, me. I send someone for a whole bowel irrigation. I just want to admit them to the observation unit for a whole bowel irrigation. I'm just going to say no. <laughs> I, I think it's likely to resolve in six to 12 hours, Sam. It's very yes, likely to resolve. Yes, in six you're absolutely to 12 hours. right. It is likely to resolve for sure. <laughs> can, I, can I tell you that this was my favorite part of the article coming up where the, the author waited and waited in the long grass and then came for glucagon and I loved it. I loved every minute of it. Tell me. Tell me I, what you I love about the glucagon that description. Always, especially in the rural places, when I was like, you know, there's this horrible food impaction or there's this foreign body, and I really just think that, that glucagon is not going to help. We're going to get vomiting. It's been in there for a day or two. I'm worried it could perforate. And GI would always give me the hardest time and say, oh, you got to try the glucagon. I don't want to see, I don't want to hear about this until you try the glucagon and see if it works or not. And I found that this mirrored my clinical experience that. Glucagon rarely works, and all it really did was create headaches and cause people to vomit, but not actually solve the problem. It's interesting, you know, I find that the propensity to reach for a glucagon is inversely proportional to the time of day. Oh, 
So I have been told by our gastrointestinal colleagues to administer glucagon far more often after hours and in the middle of the night than I have during the daytime. If it's during the daytime, they're just telling me, hey, don't waste any time. Just bring them up here. It's not going to work anyway. And if it's at night, they're going, well, what? You haven't tried it? Why did you even call me if you haven't even tried it? What if they pass it spontaneously? <laughs> Uh, and, and you're right. The data here, 9 to 33% at best will have success in clearing an esophageal food bolus after administration of glucagon. We're not talking about giving glucagon under any other circumstance. This is just an esophageal food impaction in an adult. And even then, the data is very, very skinny on whether or not this actually makes any difference. And as you mentioned, it causes nausea. It can cause vomiting. It can give a patient who's already having problems with their oral secretions higher risk for aspirations. But interestingly, the most recent time I gave glucagon, which was after hours in the middle of the night, well, was a patient who I told, I said, listen, the, the gastroenterologist would like me to administer this medicine, which might make it pass now as opposed to waiting until the morning when the team gets here. But it can cause nausea and vomiting. And the patient looked at me and said, well, if I throw up, that'll get it out, right? And if it comes out now, I get to go home. So just give me the medicine. I'll take it. That sounds like a great idea. And so the patient was all for it. Like, of course, it didn't work. But <laughs> but the patient consented and was very happy to hear that there was an option that might actually work. Or even, so, even when you sell, even when you sell it this, this, the best way possible, it still ain't working. It still didn't work. It still didn't work. But it is listed by the American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy as an acceptable option. But with a caveat, it says that it should not delay definitive endoscopic management. So you can give it, but don't waste time waiting for it to work, despite what our colleagues are telling us. Lastly, there is a little discussion of button batteries that have made their way into the stomach. So they're not in the esophagus. They're now in the stomach. What do you do with these? And the author of the article did a good job looking at recommendations from the North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition Endoscopy Committee, which publishes guidelines for gastric button battery management. It's a very specific little niche here. And their recommendation was for urgent, so 24 to 48 hour timeline, removal of gastric button batteries that are larger than two centimeters found in patients age five or less. And if they're over the age of five or have smaller button batteries ingested, like less than two centimeters, then they could be managed with observation and 48-hour repeat radiographs. So there isn't that same urgency or emergency to go after this once it's made its way into the stomach, which I found interesting given the propensity for injuries that they can cause. So the five things that will change your practice, I thought, again, that this was just a really great summary of this article. First, Gastric button batteries still require rapid time-sensitive endoscopic removal if they're large, over two centimeters, and if they're in a younger age group. So this just reinforces that sense that if you see a button battery, I don't really care where it is. I want, I want to involve everybody, and I want to get that thing out as soon as possible. A sharp rectal foreign body is removed successfully. In the emergency room, you need a follow-up sigmoidoscopy to be performed to make sure there's no mucosal injury or perforation. Plain radiographs are not reliable for small, non-metallic foreign bodies, especially fish bones. If the history suggests this ingestion, you need to do a CT scan to evaluate and assess for complications like perforation. Having just seen my first esophageal perforation yesterday after endoscopy, I mm. found that this did not present as dramatically as I thought it was going to. Mm. And I think that my desire to put people that tell convincing stories into the donut of truth has been nothing but reaffirmed by my experience reading this article in my recent practice. Mm, that's an excellent point. Honey and also sucrophate have been shown to be very effective at temporarily reducing the rate of necrosis in the setting of button battery ingestions and should be given to patients that are tolerating oral fluids and are over 12 months of age. The sucrophate can be done earlier than 12 months of age, but honey over 12 months. And children with button battery ingestions that have passed spontaneously, but who have persistent esophageal symptoms should be admitted or transferred to a center with pediatric GI 
so that they can get endoscopy to see if they have esophageal damage. Because again, you're worried about that ulcer and you're worried about if it's healing, you can have delayed complications from that. So the earlier you see it, the earlier you can address it. Fantastic. And then there is a great pearl section in this article as well. There's a lot of pearls here. I was just trying to pick out one or two that I thought were really good. I think do not assume the foreign body has been ingested rather than aspirated yeah. was a really great one because great one. symptoms can be very similar. I had a case in the rural parts of Colorado where a kid was playing with Legos with his brother and he put one in his mouth while he was building a tower and using his hands and he just put one in his mouth to hold it for a second and his brother like slapped him on the back and he just <laughs> and sucked it in. And we had weather coming in. I could hear a whistling in this kid's chest. It was a good story. And I basically had to transfer him either by flight or there was going to be a big storm in and I probably wouldn't be able to get him out till the next day. And so with an x-ray alone that showed nothing, I put this kid into a helicopter and sent him all the way to Denver. And two or three hours later, they pulled a big Lego out of his right trachea. And, and my boss later was like, you, you didn't even have any imaging that proved it. I was like, I just... I could hear it and I had to make a call and I, the clinical I did it. So and I it think was the right call. You got to You got to just, you know, to get your good history and get a good exam and then trust your experience and get these people to the definitive care they need. You got it. There it is. 2023 May article in emergency medicine practice. And again, don't forget the pathways that are in these articles show up in your mobile app and in our new interactive version of the clinical pathways. So if you've got a diagnostic dilemma, you want to run it through the pathway, this is there to help you at the point of care. This is an amazing article. Thank you, Dr. Crosby, for being the author and putting this voluminous amount of information into one article. It's exceptionally well-written, very thorough, and I highly recommend it. TR, thanks again. It's been a pleasure. I'm so afraid of, I'm so afraid of toothbrushes and magnets now. I'm just going <laughs> to... I'm just going to need to have go through to my house one more time and keep all those things away from my kids. That's right. That's right. Less than six years old, go through your house and scrub it for all of these things. Make sure everything's under lock and key and don't leave the key around because that's another one of those things they can swallow. <laughs> all right. Until next time, everybody. Thanks, TR. Thanks, guys. And that's a wrap, ladies and gentlemen. Don't forget the two things I reminded you about at the beginning of the episode. First, give us a rating in your podcast store. Again, I greatly appreciate that. And second, make sure to go to ebmedicine.net and take advantage of the bundling deals. Check out the emergency medicine, pediatric emergency medicine, and urgent care medicine resources, and the mobile app, and the interactive clinical pathways. So many tools right there at your fingertips. I can't wait for you to see them all. Until next time, everyone, be safe.